Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to Writing and Editing. This is episode 150, Always Writing Films. My guest is Pat Bradley, who is a screenwriter and director from Queens, New York. He has produced many short films, as well as the excellent full-length feature, Into the Valley, which is available for free viewing on his website. Hi, Pat. Welcome to the show, and uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, as I was mentioning when we were just talking, I spent some time uh, today, certainly, uh, looking at your website. You're, you're, you're a screenwriter and director from, uh, based in Queens, or from Queens, anyway. I'm not from sure Queens, if you're yeah. still there. Yeah, right. <laughs> I and, live in Long uh, Island now. You know, the, the natural movement from Queens <laughs> to Long Island and from New Yorkers. That's me. That's <laughs> I wanted to ask you something about something you've got on there about Queens because I was very curious to, to read it. But I, uh, I I had a look today at some of your short films, but I really took some time to look at your feature. You've got a lot of the full te- full I was going to say full text. The full version of your feature film called Into the Valley is is posted up there, yeah, fully. Uh, and uh, not to sort of. I don't know, give away or tell people what it's about, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a great story about people, you know, trying to really trying to realize um, a, a dream that they have, but uh, you know, it would have been probably easy to do or easier to do it when you were 20, but when you've got a wife, and a child and you've got other responsibilities these things are harder and can have implications and it's it's like this two different poles you 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 want to be a person who's a a good family man so to speak but you you've got a dream you've got a a passion as well and and i thought that was a a really good and i i wanted to ask you two things in particular one was what i one thing i really noticed is that there wasn't much um uh, you know, musical background soundtrack stuff. Mm-hmm. It was mostly like if people were talking, what one often, what I often see anyway in American, in American film especially, is there will be music playing, you know, I mean, the soundtrack playing, mm-hmm. and, you know, trying to tell you what kind of emotion is happening here. But there were many, if not, well, I didn't, I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched large chunks all over the, from beginning to end. But many of the things, like when people were sitting at a table talking, there was no music playing to indicate, uh, uh, you know, emotion or anything. Mm-hmm. Is is this intentional on your part, or did it just happen to be that way, or what ha- what happened no, there? For that film, it was intentional. Uh, it's a it's a music based film, so there's plenty of music throughout the film, and I just felt that using music in the film as background. So like that scene you were talking about when they're sitting at the table, if you listen closely, there is diner music playing in the background, but there's nothing to evoke any kind of emotion. We kind of wanted the actors to bring that out of, uh, to for the audience to check that out through the actors. How do you feel that that's a good reason for it actually? Yeah. So the, if there's going to be music, it'll be the Valley music and not yeah. the, uh, you know whatever soundtrack you might have so so we did have different type of music throughout scattered throughout that does evoke certain emotions like we did have uh, some heavy metal music we had some very slow r&b obviously we had the four seasons music and we had uh some hardcore rap music scattered through and we had some country music in there mm-hmm. so it depends on the scenario where the person was we wanted the music to fit that while also giving off uh, allowing the the viewer to really feel where they are more so as an emotion yeah what i found though and is that it, it wasn't i don't know I, i'm not a fan of musical soundtracks and mm-hmm. i'm certainly not a fan of uh, the the huge orchestral music that you hear on a lot of movies you know where they'll go uh, if there's a happy scene going on, it'll be all tinkly piano music. And if there's a serious scene going on, there'll be the the heavier keys. And it's 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 ridiculous, I find, and very intrusive. But a lot of people, I think a lot of people, it always reminds me, reminds me of the laugh track in a comedy show. It's basically indicating something to you. Or it reminds me of the old days where um, 
uh, you know, there was a player piano because it was a silent film, uh, that kind of thing. But I, I really liked it is, is what I'm Thank trying you. to say. I, I thought it was very balanced. You know, it's not completely spare in the sense that, and there are some films like this where they have absolutely no music. Uh, it wasn't spare like that, but there were scenes where there were, hey, people talking and no music playing, and that mm -hmm. was good. So there, there was some scenes where we had some, you know, regular film score in it, but it, we kept it very low, not to purposely change your emotion of the film because the film is a roller coaster of emotion. Yeah, just not based on the story itself. So we didn't want to kind of point you in that direction. We wanted you to figure that out for yourself. Yeah, no, you're right about the emotions. Uh, there's um joyous family times uh there's uh anger suffering uh and i want to talk a little bit about the ending uh, mm -hmm. without saying too much about it but uh um first i wanted to ask you though since you know film um well, what's your feeling about uh not necessarily your own films but what's your feeling about this what i've been referring to you know the orchestral music do you feel that that's a, 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 like a kind of just a go-to that people and they don't even think about it or do you feel that it really contribute can contribute to uh, what a film uh, says to a, a viewer well it definitely can uh, it definitely can contribute uh, it has its place so like a lot of big blockbusters will have that orchestral music and it'll fit whereas you know a small drama you know maybe you're better off with a piano just a piano Mm -hmm. You know, but music does play a big part in most films. And like, well, my writing process is to music. Like, I I can't write a screenplay without music. What do you mean? Without listening to music or without yes, being without, inspired? No, without listening. So I have, um, I pretty much have a, a very simple writing process. So I get up at 4 a.m. every morning. I go to the gym and I start my writing in the gym. So what I do is whatever story I'm working on, whatever mood I'm trying to portray that day for that day's writing assignment, I listen to that type of instrumental, that type of music. So if I'm if I have a real sad scene, I'm in the gym for 90 minutes with very sad music in my headphones. Right. And it kind of sets and it kind of, you know, sets my brain going and puts me into that mood. I might not write it into the screenplay, but I cannot physically right without that music happening somewhere in the room and when you get get out of the gym and go home and you're at your computer mm -hmm. uh, do you do the same thing do you have, have yeah. music on yep that's amazing you know what it reminds me of is you know they talk about sometimes um I, uh, an actor will uh, stay in character even between scenes mm -hmm. and i've even heard where directors refuse to let the other actors talk to the you know, this actor, the main actor, just so it doesn't break his, his, you know, the groove that he's in kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it depends on, you know, the, the severity of the scene, you know, if it's, if it's a, you know, you're not going, if an actor's not really going that deep, I don't see the point in, you know, restricting the actor from doing something. But if like in that end scene, when the actor really has to get into a dark place, we let him go in the room for about an hour himself. And he took his headphones. He took his music, sat in there for about an hour, came out and he got himself to that place where he had to, uh, where he had to take it. And that was it. Yeah. Since you mentioned that, I wanted to talk about that without actually saying what happens because mm -hmm. it's an extremely powerful scene and the way it comes together is uh, just amazing. I, I was I was kind of blown away about by it, and that you would Thank end you. there like that with that scene too is uh, incredible. Just amazingly done. Thank so I, I and I love the details of it too, where basically there's a you know it ends up basically with he he's he ends up sitting on the floor blocking the door to the bathroom, and his daughter it's his daughter right yes yeah his daughter is pounding on that same door so there's him pushing back that way and she's mm -hmm. pounding on the door to try to get in to get help and um the other jesus christ the other sad thing is that she for a different reason also 
sinks to the floor. He's sunk mm -hmm. to the floor so that he can sit and block the door. She's sinking for a very different mm -hmm. reason. And that those kind of symmetries there with a door, it's very simple, but it's, it was very fucking powerful. Thank you. I, I was I was completely blown away. And I'm I, I love uh, those kinds of and, and it's dark. Mm -hmm. Very it's a very dark ending. And uh, I was I was just totally blown away by it. It was really well done. We actually yeah. had a uh, an even darker ending to it, but uh, it didn't test well. We had a when we finished, we had uh, three different endings for it. Where we this wasn't even a real ending. So we had the, our real ending that we wrote into the script and wanted, and we shot it anyway. We knew if push came to shove, we would had to cut that because it was very very different it was much darker wow. of an ending and uh then we had uh there's a dream sequence in the end scene we had that as our secondary ending and not a dream sequence so uh both of those endings didn't really test well with the screening we had so we kind of just sat figured it out and we just moved some stuff around and we came up with that ending just abruptly yeah, I, I think for end, endings are important and, and the, the power that was, this seemed to me to be building to something that at some point you realize that he's going to go through with this. He's going to, he's going to actually do it. He's not going to, you know, get up like you might see in a, a Hallmark movie and say, you know, open the door and run for another thing and, and all that. That's not going to happen. And uh, what's the word I'm, th I'm thinking of? Um you feel it coming like there's a point at which no this is not going to happen and then you feel kind of relentlessly that uh irretrievably this yeah this is going yeah. to happen and for me the key is uh again i'm no expert but uh, uh uh is when you cut it right and this cuts at just the right point where you go where it just leaves it's you startling yeah no yeah. right and you're left going Fuck! It did happen. This did happen. Yeah, I I don't know that it was just just really really amazing to to, I, to see to see. I actually got called a piece of shit at our uh, screening <laughs> because of the ending. Like, because the end, you're either gonna love it or hate it. There's kind of no in between with the ending, right? And uh, you know, a lot of pe people are parents, and they you know they feel a certain way about you know because everything in mainstream kind of ends on a light happy note you know mm -hmm. you always get that redemption case mm -hmm. however it was his redemption not hers yeah that we were going for we were going for him to be the protagonist not the antagonist which is everybody feels someone like that would be an antagonist not a protagonist so we actually wrote the villain as a protagonist yeah yeah no and in my view, anyway, I'd be curious of your thoughts on this. People who call you a piece of shit about that. Um, I mean, you're I getting, love it. You're getting movies in real life mixed up there, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, that's a horrible thing. If if you had arranged that with your friend to, for that to happen. Yeah, you are a piece of shit, but you're doing a movie and the dark things happen, right? I Real life, dark things happen. Yeah, exactly. You know, so. so I find that uh, I, I don't get that when people say that they'll say, oh, my God, did it have to be, you know, did he have to stab that man five times? It's a movie, for God's sake. You know? I mean, that that's where the story took it. You know, yeah. I we didn't go with that ending in mind. You know, that's kind of just the natural progress of the story. That's where it went. Yeah. I want to ask you, sorry for if this is a bit of a fruity question, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I I have seen movies, a lot of the actually um, the European movies and like that, especially like Nordic movies, which tend to be pretty dark. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether, uh, you know, there are certain directors, especially in Europe, that you like or certain types of film or, or anything like that. Uh, there's nothing really specific. I mean, I like all all film. I mean, I, I'm mostly psychological, uh, psychological thriller, horror, you know, I really love the, I do like the darker stuff, uh, but I can enjoy a romantic comedy at the same time. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of film as long as it's 
written well because you know first and foremost i am a writer you know so as long as there's the writing and the story is there i'm a, I'm a fan of it and you know directors everybody makes good everybody makes bad you know so mm -hmm. it, you know i i like a lot of stuff from certain people i don't like stuff from them also so there's really no kind of one size fits all for me i'm kind of all over the place yeah, I'm glad to hear you mention writing because I, I feel that that's where a lot of it starts, right? If you don't have good writing, of course, if you don't have good acting, it's not going to be very good either. But if you don't have good writing to start with, uh, I mean, it's, isn't it kind of hopeless? Uh, is it hard? Is it? Can you make a movie, a good movie, out of bad writing? It depends on who you ask. <laughs> you know, because uh, you ask a director, the writers don't matter. <laughs> you ask, you know, this guy, the director, you know, it's it all depends who you ask. But uh, being somebody that can do any aspect of film, like I can be a cinematographer, I can be a director, I could be a writer. And uh, writing to me would be the most important part of a film. Mm -hmm. uh, because without the story, you're directing people where? Yeah. You know, I mean, we I do, do tend to do a lot of rewrites during the actual filming process. Like there were some scenes in Into the Valley that I wrote the night before just because something else didn't fit. I wound up writing a scene and sending it to the actors. We're going to do this instead of that because we had to make this one adjustment two days ago. Yeah. Now this scene is no longer going to fit. So now without a writer, a director is not going to do that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so yeah. Yeah. And nothing I, I get... goes perfect during filming. So there, there's always something that you're going to have to redo or rework or. I can imagine. I only imagine I, I, I've i never been on a set or anything like that or been involved in. The, I don't know anything about the how a movie gets produced, but I can imagine that must be the case because at the end of the, you know, when at the credits at the end, you've got, I don't know, 200 people listed. there, <laughs> So something is going to go actually, wrong somehow. We, uh, so into the valley, we actually were really small crew really for the most part we had i think a total actors crew everybody 40 people oh my wow not, that's not including the extras because we rented out a bar so you know there's probably like 40 50 people in the bar at that time mm -hmm. you know not counting all those extras but for the most part there was about uh maybe nine crew members Wow. Nine or 10 crew members, which is usually there's about seven or eight on a camera team on a professional film. Yeah. So it, it was very, very tight, a very tight crew. Yeah. It shows you, though, that, uh, you know, say the movies I was just talking about where there's a list of 200 p credits at the end. Uh, and that could be a movie you I would detest. It's not, it doesn't matter. I mean, you need someone running a camera and you need someone directing and you need basics. But uh, sometimes, you know, uh, it's it's not the numbers at the end that matter. It's uh, I liked what you were saying about uh, not only story, but writing, which I interpret as, um, uh, you know, good choice of words, choice, cho choice of words, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, those are I, I consider that to be super important so yeah because you can you can hide so much in dialogue that people won't pick up for another three or four or five watches yeah so it, it's fun to me like nobody's ever mentioned about uh our main character and him trying to achieve his dream in his late 30s yeah you're the first person to ever mention that to me oh. and we we did that specifically like that was something that we specifically did to try to get that reaction from people and it just didn't hit with 99% of the people. Interesting. And well, there's, you know, a lot of people just don't pick up on certain things. Yeah. No, I find but for, sorry, it's go all ahead. in there, but it's all in there. Yeah. Everything is written in there specifically. So when somebody picks up on something, you know, it, it actually makes me feel yeah. good that they can actually pick up. And in there for a reason and in there, consciously it's not as yes. if it just happened that no no no, know, no nothing yeah. I, i'm pretty detailed with everything so good yeah. i usually try to write something where you can take away three 
three different three different people can take away three different messages from a film. Yeah. And it's and it's all intentional. Yeah. 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 Even and, even in my short films, I mean there's not that much to work with. Maybe anywhere from like 15 to 20 pages I try to keep the short films. But even there, three di- I make sure in every film there's three different messages that you could take away from on uh polar opposites and then your basic message. Right. Do you see, uh, since you mentioned your short films, um, uh, there, there's a couple on the site, Mega Millions and Double Zero mm-hmm. and some other ones. I'm not sure if they're there, but that you mentioned that you did mm-hmm. very, very early on when you set mm-hmm. up your production company. Do you see your your shorts, your short films as, uh, I'm sorry to use this crude term, but a promotional tool or do you see them as sort of like the difference between a short story and a novel? It's exactly the same process mm-hmm. and and uh, uh, you know artistic talent and intelligence that goes into it. It's just that it's shorter. Uh, uh, how, how, how do you see this? How do you a little a little that? of both? Yeah, a little of both. Uh, my uh, we have a film, a short film, Double Zero. Uh, it should be on Amazon uh, April first. Should be nice. able to watch it on Amazon April first. Uh, it's actually a proof of a concept. So I have a TV series that I've been trying to get on air for uh, a couple of years now. And uh, I decided I want to make a short film about the main character. I wanted to kind of pitch it alongside uh, like the show Bible and the pilot script and all my other promotional materials. I wanted to do this short film towards uh, and put it towards that. So that was yeah. more of a promotional tool, right? Where, whereas a lot of other ones are just because I write every single day. I write, I try to get four to five pages done every single day, no matter what. So I have just a stockpile of scripts, short films, uh, feature films, TV pilots, just a whole stockpile. I'm not a real, I mean, it depends who you, you a lot of people don't call screenwriters real writers. Hmm. They're kind of like the uh, uh, like this redheaded stepchildren of the writing community. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, like, like the I old can't write a novel. Man. <laughs> I can't write a novel to save my life. I I could barely speak English correctly, but <laughs> when it comes to structuring a story in the format for the screen, I'm great at that. Yeah. You ask me to write a novel, I'm gonna throw you out of my house. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, but those are those are you know two very different art forms, right? Two so, completely different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's so just with, like, sorry, like go ahead. A, a lot of short films do turn into feature films. Yeah. But uh sometimes you're writing a story and there's nowhere else to take it. Like you yeah. can only take it so far. Yeah. And I really enjoy the aspect of filmmaking. Uh, it's an expensive hobby. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I probably have like maybe 15 or 20 that I would want to do eventually. Uh, some short films that I would want to do eventually. But uh, like, I can't take the story anywhere else. Like the story might only go five pages. Like we have one we're shooting next month. Uh, we're, oh, we're only in March. So we have one we're shooting in May. Uh, writing the story. It took me six pages. And I was like, shit, I can't go anywhere else. I was like, yeah. if I do, it's going to feel forced. Yeah. So I I have a couple actor friends. We're just going to rent a cabin upstate and just film. It's like a little short horror and just do it for fun. Yeah. Yeah. That could, that could sound, sounds like it could be. You know, I have so much going on up here. I got to kind of get it out. Yeah. So it's... uh. I- I know from experience, I mean, I don't know how the numbers translate or whatever, you know, one is one is metric and one's imperial, but mm-hmm. to write five to write four or five pages a day, that's a huge amount of writing. When I, I've, I've written a couple of novels and my aim was always to write every day and the maximum I could achieve without just being exhausted because I had a day job as well was 250 words, which is about a page. And uh, of course, there's a difference between screenwriting and blah, 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 all that. But still, I know that that's, uh, you know, people might say four pages. hmm, That's a lot of writing. That is a lot of writing to do. So 
those four pages might end up only, I might write those same four pages all seven days of the week. So I write the four pages the first day. I'll go back. I didn't like this. I didn't like that. I didn't like this. Take that out, edit that. And it still might end up only four pages by the end of the week. But now I have a final four pages. Yeah. No. So okay. It could, it could be something like that. But uh, it, it that's usually that. You know, because I, I can't write a perfect scene in one shot. You know, not many people can, but yeah. And then, you know, because you always want to tweak a line of dialogue here. You always want to, you know, I want to add a bird flying in the background for no reason. Like you always want to do something. Right, right. And no, that's, that's usually what happens. That's that's still good. It's still I, I still stand by my statement that even though if you start off with the same four pages at the beginning of the week and still end up with four pages, but you've uh, massaged it so that it's a much better thing. That's, you know, that's, that's the writing process uh, yeah. defined there. Right. Yeah. So. I, I, I hate writing like one whole draft and then going back and editing again and again and again and again, I kind of take it scene by scene. Yeah. So I know a, a lot of writers will just get that draft out. They'll just pump whatever it is. They'll pump out that draft in three weeks and then they got to rewrite it again. And then it takes them another three weeks and another three weeks and another three weeks. Whereas it might take me three or four days and I have the scene that I want. Yep. So, you know, once I finish a script, it's, you know, it's got to be touched up, obviously. But for the most part, it's pretty close to where I want. Yeah. And because... it's two months, maybe three months. Yeah. That's an interesting way to go about it. That's kind of the way I write as well, that I don't, I work, like, say, if I'm working on a chapter, I will perfect, perfect mm -hmm. that chapter. I won't write, like, I won't do a word dump kind of thing and then go back and cut out a bunch of stuff of 50,000 words. I do, similar to what you're saying, uh, where you perfect one piece, and at the end, what you have is, say, if it's 12 chapters, you know, yeah, you're right. There's some, a little bit of massaging to do, but it's pretty, it's pretty much close. done. Yeah. 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 I wanted to end off by asking you about the, the, the Queens thing that I saw on your site. Cause I, I think I know what you mean, but I'm not quite sure I do. Uh, it's basically a, just a brief bio you have of yourself. Mm -hmm. Pat Bradley is a screenwriter director from Queens, New York, which is the linguistics capital of the world unfortunately he never took advantage of this butchering every language possible i take that to mean two things one was one is that when you say it's a linguistic do you mean that there's just a ton of languages or dialects spoken? no it is actually the linguistic capital of the world there is the most languages spoken in queens new york than anywhere else in the world oh you mean because of uh, immigration and that sort of yeah thing. they queens is the most diverse city county whatever you want to call it in the world so okay. and as as a kid, you know, we grew up in apartment complexes. So there's 16 floors to a building. There's uh, maybe 20 apartments per floor and there's eight buildings in the complex. So there's every kind of ethnicity, race, religion, everybody, every language you could think of is in those eight buildings. Right. And you learn them. You learn. I mean, you learn enough. So, you know, you don't get killed or anything like that, but you learned enough to be able to communicate with people who don't speak English. Right. And I, I barely, I could barely form words in English. So that's to tell you how bad I am at other languages. <laughs> I can speak probably 30 languages, eight words. And that's it. <laughs> You've done pretty well in this English interview, I have to tell you. I've understood every single word you've said. Even with the New York accent? <laughs> Even with the New York accent. <laughs> I, I've done a lot of interviews where people, uh, they have a problem with the accent. They can't understand certain things. So That's interesting. I can hear it. And it's very... Uh, like different from my accent, which I, I don't know. I have a Canadian accent, maybe. Well, you're on know. the... Uh... You're on the eastern part of Canada, right? That's right. Eastern, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, it's close enough where, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's right. Maybe the sounds from Queens are wafting up my way. Who I, knows? I've been to Toronto a few times. I have a cousin in Toronto. <laughs> you know, you can pick up a few words. Pat, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you very Thank much. You, and man. super informative.
Yeah, and also, um, uh, congrats on that film, Into the Valley. Uh, that, amazing, just amazing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Take care. And that's all for this episode. Thanks for listening. Check out the show's website at writingediting.ca to find all past episodes, how to subscribe or contact me, and how to rate or review the podcast. I'll be back on Saturday for another short feature in the series, One More Word. Please join me.